Let's pray, and then we're going to just dive in for a little bit here, okay? Lord, I just trust you to lead us and guide us in this time. Lord, we trust that your word would um, be heard, not just in our ears, although that's very important, but also that we would hear what you have to say to us this morning in our hearts, that you would speak to our very souls, Lord. We know that faith comes by hearing the word. And so we pray that faith would come today through the work of your Holy Spirit. We know that it will be your spirit that is needed to come and work. So we pray for your spirit to come which you tell us if we ask for your spirit, you will absolutely do that. What father would give a, a scorpion to a child who asks for a, a loaf of some bread? So we know, we know that you will send your spirit if we ask. So we ask you to send your spirit. And now as we proclaim the word, as we hear that word, we pray for faith to come. To those who have already have faith in their hearts, that they'd be strengthened in their faith. And to those that maybe don't have faith, faith, Lord, that faith would come today. So stir us up and move us. Help us to hear from you today. And that's Seth. We don't, we don't really care what Seth thinks. We want to hear what your, you say to us, God, from your word. So help that to come through really clearly. We pray this boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, we're kicking off a new series today called Second Timothy, Peace, Purpose, Power. Second Timothy is a book in the Bible that you can find. It's kind of a hard one to find because it's really short. It's only four chapters. So in my Bible, it's like one page. You know what I'm saying? So out of this whole bad boy, you got to go find that thing. So go to an index or something like that or, or look it up. But you're looking for Second Timothy. Now, who in the world is Timothy? I got a picture of him. So I, I got some connections with Timmy, my, my man Timmy. This is Timmy, okay? This is my man, Timmy. That's a selfie that we were able to dig. Archaeology dug this bad boy up, and we finally got it. Okay, maybe not, maybe not. This is just a rendition. But Timothy is a guy who's really important in the Bible, okay? Timothy's super important in the Bible, and honestly, as I've been studying him this past week, he's kind of more important than I even, he, he's kind of a big deal, Okay? Um, so you probably know about a guy named Paul, but maybe not. So let me just talk Paul for a second. Paul is a guy in the Bible who wrote a bunch of the Bible. So he, Paul is a missionary who lived after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. Uh, Paul wrote something. He, he wrote the books of the Bible. He wrote Romans. He wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He wrote Galatians. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Paul wrote those. And then he also wrote Titus and he wrote Philemon. And so the Apostle Paul wrote a bunch of the Bible. He wrote a bunch of the letters of, of the Bible, the letter we're going to be focusing on is a letter that Paul wrote to a guy named Timothy, and we're especially over the next couple of weeks going to be looking at 2 Timothy, okay? That's what we're going to be focusing our attention on. Now, Paul and Timothy uh, are, are go like hand in hand. Timothy was really important to Paul, more important than I even think I realized. As I was looking at it this past week, Timothy even comes up as like a kind of co-author dude in six of Paul's writings. And so you can see, I don't have this on the screen, but like in uh, 2 Corinthians, he does it in 2 Corinthians. Um, he says when he writes to the church in Corinth, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. And he does that six different times in 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. So Timothy is there with Paul when he's writing a bunch of the Bible, essentially. That's pretty cool. 
That's pretty cool. So Timothy is important to Paul in that way, but he's also brought up a bunch in the Bible. And I just want to take you to a couple spots here. First Corinthians. Uh, so Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And when he's writing to the church in Corinth, he says this in chapter four, verse 17. He says this, he says, uh, this is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So Paul trusts Timothy enough to send him off and say, go teach them the things that I would teach them. That's a lot of trust in a guy, right? He says this when he talks to the church in Philippi. So if you go to Philippians chapter 2, I have these on the screen. Philippians chapter 2 verse 20, he says this of Timothy. For I have no one like him. He's talking about Timothy. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. And that's a lot, of, a lot to be said from Paul, who's talking about Timothy there. Timothy first comes up in Acts chapter 16. Uh, so you can open your Bible if you wanted to, to Acts chapter 16, and you'd see Timothy coming up and potentially as the first encounter. We don't know this. Paul had actually been to Lystra, which is where Timothy was from, uh, on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. This is Paul's second missionary journey. So this is the first time Timothy comes up. It might be the second time Paul's actually been with Timothy. We just don't know. But here we are told that Timothy um, was, was, is in Lystra and um, his mom was a Jewish mom. And um, it, we'll find out from today's reading that his mom and his grandmom were important to his faith development. And uh, so we'll see that from today's reading. But you can see in Acts chapter 16, Paul really has an appreciation right away for Timothy and wants to use him to advance the gospel and invites him to come along with him on his missionary journey. So Paul and Timothy kind of go hand in hand. After Paul dies... Timothy leads another 30 plus years of life and is eventually um, what appears from tradition we see to be martyred, um, to be martyred in around 97 AD. And um, yeah, is killed as like an 80 year old something maybe man. That's the life of Timothy. <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to do is just kind of highlight that a little bit to try to show you how important Timothy really is to Paul. So important that Paul would even spend time to write a letter, 1 Timothy, and then a second letter, 2 Timothy, to this fellow overseer, pastor, um, as, as they're proclaiming the gospel all over the Roman, Roman Empire. So we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy, and what I want to first note to you is that this is the last letter that Paul writes that we're aware of. And uh, Paul is in prison in, in this letter. Paul is in prison. And Paul, and I think this is really important to reading this letter, Paul actually senses he's going to probably be killed soon. And this comes up in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is what he says to Timothy. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul is sensing he's going to be killed soon. Now that's important for us, because as you read that kind of letter, knowing that information now, it, it triggers for us that, man... I mean, you know, if I read, if you showed me a letter that you read, wrote someday, you know, or you, you wrote a while back, I'd probably be like, okay, cool, that's fine. But if I was told this is the last letter you ever wrote, 
I'd probably look at, and you knew this kind of was kind of coming up to be your last letter. I'd be kind of looking at that with a different lens. I'd be looking at that like, what do they say? I'm kind of curious. That's, we need to enter into 2 Timothy a bit curious, thinking that, that, that Paul senses this might be his last letter he ever writes. What's he going to say? I mean, Paul's an incredible missionary of the gospel. And we care so much about what he says in Romans, and we care so much about what he says in, 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 in the Corinthian, to the Corinthian church, and all over the place. What's he going to say? Like the last thing he says. And that's kind of what caught my attention for this being our series in the next couple of weeks. We're coming out, and I want to share with you how this series kind of came to be. Just fast. And then I'm going to get into the teaching today, okay? Um, first of all, I'd simply say this. We're coming out of Easter. Easter's a big deal. Christ is risen, right? He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Like we celebrate this week after week after week. But coming off of Easter, I wanted to come out with a series like come out with a bang. But I'll be honest with you. It's, I've been struggling with, with where to go, <laughs> with what to get you. And so last week when David preached... And I told him, I said, David, just preach whatever's on your heart. Just preach wherever God's leading you. When he preached peace, purpose, and power coming out of John chapter 20, that hit me. And sometimes, listen, sometimes when you just don't know what to do, I'm going to encourage you with something. I'd encourage you when you just feel kind of, I don't know where to go, God. I don't know what to do. Connect yourself up with somebody you trust. And, and, and get fed by the stuff that's feeding them. So I'll be honest with you, I kind of connected myself up a little bit with David this past week. And because here's the deal, 2 Timothy, peace, purpose, power, that's not necessary. See, a lot of people would actually be mad at me. They're like, wait a second, 2 Timothy's not about peace, purpose, and power. No, that, I get it. I get it. But here's what I got the sense of. I got the sense we were supposed to do 2 Timothy, and I got the sense that something was connected to peace, purpose, and power. And I'm not saying that, I just sense there's going to be like two series in one. Holy cow. That's like double dipping. You ever do the double dipping classes when you're in college or something like that? You take one, you get two credits for boop, boop, boop. You're going to get to double dip the next couple of weeks. We're going to get like two series in one. So I'm kind of excited about it. Kind of excited about it. There's four chapters in here of awesomeness. I mean, I've read through it now this past week, and I'm just like, this is going to change somebody's entire life. It's going to change their entire life. So that's the setup to the series. Let's dive in. All I'm going to do today is read a little bit and then talk a little bit. Read a little bit, talk a little bit, and I'm going to kind of keep moving today. There are three quick points. Here it is. Let's read. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child. I mean, he really sees himself as a mentor here. Grace, mercy, and peace. I'm going to go, I'm going to pick, I'm going to see that word. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, Paul's sitting in prison writing this. And he's probably going to die soon and he senses that. This is not Paul sitting in a hot tub smoking a cigar. He's, he's, he's in a prison cell and he's able to say something like grace, mercy, and peace to you. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you. I mean, they just love, they were buddies. They were just buddies. I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. You brought me so much joy. Just your presence brought me joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. What's he doing here? Highlighting Lois and Eunice is, is something that kind of stood out to me. And, and the way in which he's, you know, Paul's reminiscing a little bit here, isn't he? He's kind of, he's kind of, and I wonder if he's doing it for two people. One, himself. You ever been in such a tight spot? You're just in a rough spot that you just got to kind of stop and remember some of those other days. 
I longed for that joy that I had when me and you were together. And we were, do- remember that time when we were doing that? Remember that, how cool that was? He's just doing some reminiscing. But he's also bringing some encouragement to Timothy. I mean, remember, guys, they're in the throes of the Roman Empire. They're beginning to experience at a higher level the persecution of what it's going to look like to be the kind of people who follow Jesus in a culture that really doesn't have anything to do with that. It's ramping up, too, right about here as he's reading this. It's starting to ramp up, and, and so he starts to encourage him with just the, a little bit of encouragement from their past. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, as we move forward into the future, sometimes it can be important for us to remember where we've come from, to not forget our past. Do you remember do you remember that person who really impacted you in a, in a powerful way 10 years ago? Do you remember that person? Do you remember the person who, even as you think about them now, you're like, man, they don't even, I don't even know if they really believe in Jesus per se, but they always had me, you know, my mom always had me kneel down beside my bed and say my little prayers. Do you remember that moment? Uh, do you remember? Do you remember the person who unpacked for you the stories, some of the stories of the Bible? Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, or maybe you went to Awanas or something like that Wednesday nights. Maybe it was your grandma who drove you there, or maybe it was your your neighbor across the street who always invited you. Hey, jump in the van with us. I'll take you over there. I don't know your stories. I'm just. When you think back to those people who impacted you in some of the earliest days of your faith walk, don't forget those moments. Here, Paul is encouraging Timothy. Man, Lois and Eunice, they were really impactful and really important for your life. Paul didn't have to go there. Paul probably taught Timothy more than those people ever did. Paul could have just went on and on and on about all the stuff that he's been teaching them these past years as they've been missionaries together. No, he, he grounds the encouragement in, do you remember back when your mom used to do what she did with you? Do you remember back to your grandma? There's actually a painting on Google, you can Google it, by Rembrandt. Rembrandt? I think it's Rembrandt. I don't know. I don't know, he lived 1600s or something. But it's a picture of, of the grandma uh, Lois with little Timothy and there's a little scriptures there and uh, you can go look that picture up and I thought that's a really I like that picture that's a cool picture and I was thinking man how many of us in the room today need to be reminded of how important it is to be walking with our kids and our grandkids and to be remembering back to those who did that for us encouraging Timothy with the story, you know, look at, look at, I don't, I don't have this on the screen, but I just found this this morning as I was, as I was walking through this, this text from Psalm 77. I just, this is what the psalmist says about how important it is to remember. He says, I will ponder all of your work and meditate on your mighty deeds Yes, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. So much of the Christian life is remembering what God has done. It's one of the things, the, one of the reasons we come together week after week after week. It's to remember. Yeah, to learn some new stuff too. Cool. But if you walk out of here and you didn't learn a single thing today, at least my hope and prayer is that you were reminded of what God has done for you and how much he loves you. And don't think, as a lot of people think today, well, once I have it, now I don't really need to remember it. Don't don't think in your mind that it's, well, I'll never forget it. Because I see, honestly, a lot of people slipping. And it's a lot of times because they're just forgetting. Remember, uh, let's, re- let's read a little bit more. Uh, verse six, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame 
the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but for share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, watch this, this is two weeks ago, Easter, who abolished death, holy smokes, that's cool, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. What's he doing here? I only could think of it like this. He's trying to fire him up a little bit. He's trying to stoke the fire. You guys, you guys, I, this is something, this is a little trick I've learned. I'm gonna teach you something. You will learn something today maybe. If you get a fire going, and then it doesn't have enough oxygen. What do you always do? I always used to go down and, uh, you know, <clears throat> right? And then, I, and then I started learning, no, that's not the way to do it. You start to grab like a piece of cardboard or something. Well, guess what I've learned is even better. <laughs> you guys got one of these? These things work awesome at stoking a fire. I got this little thing to blow, you know, dust out of my garage and stuff. No way. Now it's like my main fire stoker. Sometimes you just, you know, my fire starts to die or something and I just, I just blast that thing. And the flames just go skyrocketing through the roof. That's what Paul's doing here is he's saying, I want you to fan into flame the gift that's been given to you. That's kind of what I want. That's my sense today is how do I stoke the fire with y'all? How do I get you fired up for, for the things that God has been doing in your life and what he wants to be doing in your life? I mean, sometimes isn't it true that we can start to almost grow cold and we can start to kind of get down just to the, to the bare bones? And I wonder if it's because we're not remembering where we've been and what God has done. And if we're not really entering into the purposes that he has for us, look at what he grounds some of these things in. He grounds this fire yourself up. He grounds it in power, love, self-control, a savior who saved you, grace, purpose. He uses the word purpose. There's actually purpose to your life. This is where David's message, peace, purpose, power, started to, I'm seeing the connections to some of this stuff. And he grounds this idea of fan into flame the gift that's been given to you. How many of you just need, like, that should, we should just have you come up here and I just blow in your face, you know? Fan that baby into flame. I don't know. That's what I want you to leave here thinking about is, is just getting blasted with, with, with the air, getting some oxygen. And I can't help, I actually, ah, I've been struggling with whether or not to go here, but once I get going, I just start to do stuff that I wasn't going to do. Second Timothy chapter three. Now, this is not a direct, I'm making a more of a, a, a a preaching move than the, the actual text is not do, doing this. But listen, chapter three, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Some of you to get fired back up need to get in the word of God again and be hearing the voice of the shepherd who wants to Work through that breathing on the word of God. Again, I'm making some moves there that the text isn't telling me to do. But all I'm doing is trying to help you. Maybe getting refired up again is get back in the word of God. It's grounded in what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has gone to the cross. Jesus abolished death. Paul says in our text today. He abolished death. He's given life. 
um, we'll just stick with the text. He actually does a lot of different things with the cross, his death and resurrection from the dead. But in this text, it's telling us he abolishes death so we don't even have to fear death itself. And then in his resurrection from the dead, which is what we celebrated two weeks ago, Easter Sunday, he rises from the dead victoriously. He's abolishing death and giving you life. And he promises that for every single person in the room. And so the person who doesn't feel like they have a connection with Jesus yet, do you know what that can look like? It can look like today you trusting in him as your savior, which means you even have to need a savior, which our culture, I'm just telling you right now, our culture teaches you you don't need a savior. Our culture teaches you to just look inside of yourself and try to find the little magic swirly thing or something that the Disney movies teach us. And once you find that, let that baby just out and be who you were gonna, let it go, you know, all that. And the word of God says it different. The word of God says, no, it's going to come from outside to you. Faith comes through hearing the word. And so now from outside, you need to recognize that as you look inside, what you're going to find is actually brokenness, sin, disease, death. You're going to look inside and you're going to find you are in need of a savior. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you look inside and you find all this magic stuff, I'm going to tell you, be cautious. If you look inside and you see brokenness and need for a savior, now we're tracking. Now that's all you need to do is make sure you grab the right savior who's actually saved you. And Paul is saying, that's Jesus who came to save you from your sin, death, the power of the enemy. And so today, you can literally trust in that. You can trust in him to be connected to him. So that's anybody in the room. And that can be the person who is a follower of Jesus, and you're just kind of growing dim. You're kind of growing cold. You need to stoke the fire again. Well, what are you going to do? Is it learning more information about the Bible? Or maybe do you need to be reminded of the exact same thing? Look inside, see the brokenness, see how how much of a sinner you are in that, look at, you've even grown cold, you sinner. You know what I'm saying, stick with me. You look inside, you see the brokenness, and you too look to Jesus again. See, the gospel is for the person who's never heard it before, and it's for the person who's heard it a million times. You need to be stoked in the fire. Fan again into flame. The gift that's been given to you. In short, Paul recognizes that it's a short amount of time that he has left, and he's going to start taking us to some of the most important things that he finds important. That's what's really cool about 2 Timothy. And he already starts to do it in this first chapter. And then this last point is this. Uh, But I am not ashamed. This is Paul saying this. I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Again, he's going to Christ. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. That's interesting because the pronouns shift from us stuff in verses like eight through 10-ish. And then in verse 11, he starts to move to I statements. And so my last point that I wanted to share with you today is simply this. Paul is revealing to Timothy his own example. So as he's trying to fire up Timothy, he he ends this particular point here with this thought, I'm all in. I'm all in, Paul is saying. Like I believe this all the way. To the point that I'm probably going to die for this. 
And Paul wants to encourage Timothy with that thought that he is all in. And, and, and really my questions are two coming out of this to share with you. First question, are you all in and have you been that for somebody else? Do other people know that you're all in? Do other people even know that? When people look at your life, your friends, your fa- people around you, when people look at your life, do they look at you and think of you as somebody who's all in? Or do they look at you as somebody who believes in God so I don't have to go to hell one day? So do people look at you like that? And I just, I'm just... Pushing you, I'm just challenging you a little bit. And then second of all, who is that person for you? Who is that person as you look at them that you're just like, man, that person is all in and I want to be kind of close to that person enough so that I can receive encouragement from that person because Paul recognized, Paul's not trying to brag here. He's just saying, I'm all in to the point I'm literally in prison. I'm probably going to die for my faith and I'm, I don't have much more that I get to say to you, but I do want to tell you, I do want to tell you that I want you to follow the pattern that I have set for you I want you to follow me as I'm following Christ. Um, I want you to know that I am convinced of these things, that I have believed in Jesus as my Savior. Uh, I want you to be conv- recognize that I am convinced that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we're going to guard that. We're going to guard it with everything we have, and I'm never going to let go of that. Man, the encouragement that that would bring to somebody. Because here's the deal. When I think about the people in my life who are all in, and I look at them and I'm like, they're all in. Um, They're just, they're massively important to me. Massively important. They are, let me say it like this, because this makes sense to me. This isn't in my notes, so I always get nervous when I don't say stuff not in my notes. They are the kind of people in my life where if they called me on the phone right now, let's take my dad. If my dad called me right now and said, hey, I want to let you know that I have cancer and I'm dying. Now, that would impact me in a big way and that would, okay, that would be rough. But I, th- I think I can honestly say that wouldn't... that wouldn't impact my faith in a negative way, the way, follow me here for a second, the way it would if he called me and said, hey Seth, you know how I taught you about Jesus at the dinner table all those years? And how I, uh, you know, we did family devotions every night. And you know how I've been a lumber salesman and I've been taken very serious. At, yeah, I just don't believe in any of that anymore. You know, could you imagine how I would have to process that? That would be way harder for me. I'll tell you that right now. That would be way harder for me than if I get the call that my dad died or something, which would be really hard. My simple point is, I look at someone like my dad or siblings or people in my life who I'm just like, they are all in, all the way. And that impacts me. That encourages me. That, in some ways, it strengthens me. It, you kind of go arm in arm with some people. We need those kind of people in our lives, guys. Paul is that for Timothy. Timothy has been that for Paul. Are we that for each other? Or are we actually showing people that what we believe is something like, um, you know, we basically are deists. Is that what we're actually showing people in our lives? And by a deist, I just mean, yeah, I kind of believe in a God who's floating around out there. I I think the best term, because I see this in the Christian church in the West, is, and I've taught this before, moralistic, therapeutic deism. 
which is what a lot of people are. They think that they, to be in heaven someday, it's all about morality. Therapeutic is basically as long as God is, is my life is okay, I kind of am okay with it. And deist as in he's way out there and I want to keep him close enough that if I'm ever really in need, I can get him. But otherwise, I'm the ruler and king of my life. That's what most people believe in the West. Is that what we're showing people? Do a little inventory on your life and just ask yourself, am I showing people that I'm all in behind this Jesus guy? And who are those people in my life? And am I connecting myself up with them so that they can be encouraging me? Second Timothy is going to be, here's what, here's what Timothy, or Paul's going to do. Paul's going to emphasize Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the way through these four chapters. It's the main thing. He's the main thing. What an encouragement that's going to be to Timothy. I believe it's going to be an encouragement to us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the encouragement that your word brings to us. This encouragement of your spirit's work and activity in our lives through your word. I thank you, God, that your word is living and active so much so that we can literally take a word that was given to Timothy from Paul and apply it to our lives and see and hear you talking to us through those same words. That blows my mind. And I just thank you, God, that your, your word is like that. It literally speaks to us. So this chapter one, or most of chapter one here, as we, as we hear it today, and as maybe we read it a couple more times this week, may it speak to our hearts, God. May it speak to our lives. Holy Spirit, come and flow. Flood us with your presence. Do that work in us that only you can do. Move us to the next steps that you'd have us take, Lord. Maybe it's to, the, to take a step towards baptism. Maybe it's a step towards taking cookies to a next door neighbor. Maybe it's a step towards re just spending some time in your word this week. Or maybe it's a step in the direction of whatever. Whatever the, the way in which you're speaking to us, give us the courage, God, to walk in that this next week. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being our God. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.